Tonight, a double-digit jump at the pump for millions of Canadians. Crazy, crazy. I can't, I can't believe it. It's expensive. What's fueling the price hike now and how long it could last? Why some women in wheelchairs are finding it hard to get the mammograms they need. How did you feel in that moment? I felt like second-class citizen. And at issue, selling the budget. We raised some additional revenue, asking those at the very top to pay a little bit more. But are Canadians buying it? From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. We begin tonight with breaking news, reports of explosions in Iran. And according to multiple American news outlets, this was an Israeli strike. Let's take you right to the region. Our Chris Brown is in Jerusalem. And Chris, this story is developing quickly and there is a lot of contradictory information. We do have dueling narratives uh, this morning, uh, Jerusalem time here. Several American networks, along with the New York Times, are reporting that Israel has attacked uh, at least one target in Iran, but uh, sources in Iran are saying there was no attack uh, and that the explosions that people heard in the skies uh, were actually the result of uh, air defense systems working. The Iranian media has said three drones were struck in the area of uh, Isfahan, uh, Isfahan, and its air defenses, as I say, were the ones that took them down. It's a very significant area. Uh, that city hosts a major military base. There's also uh, components of Iran's nuclear program uh, in the wider area around it as well. Uh, we're also hearing uh, some Israeli reports uh, that there may also have been uh, targets struck in uh, southern Syria as well, Iranian-linked targets in southern Syria, Ian turn out to be an Israeli strike on Iran and of course as you say there are contradictory uh, reports about that but if indeed it does turn out to be an Israeli strike it raises questions about Iran's response. Well, this whole region really is on a knife's edge right now. Uh, remember that Israel destroyed uh, an Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, back on April the 1st and killed several senior military commanders. Uh, Iran took its time and then launched a major uh, drone and missile strike involving some 300 projectiles fired at Israel. Uh, Israel's position was that was not a, let's say, valid response, that it actually crossed a red line. Uh, it was the first time that Iran had struck at Israel and also the size of the attack required uh, help from the United States, uh, Great Britain and Jordan in order to shoot down all of the missiles. So uh, the real concern is that uh, we were in the middle beginning at the, at the cycle of a very dangerous tit-for-tat escalation uh, that could continue to grow, but uh, it's also very notable that Iran's early suggestion this evening that uh, there was no attack uh, might be an indication that the uh, government there is trying to downplay this. Lots of questions to be answered. I know you're going to be working this story in Jerusalem where it is already, as you point out, Friday morning. Chris Brown reporting for us. In a UN Security Council vote tonight, the U.S. vetoed a Palestinian bid to be recognized as a full member state. Twelve votes in favor, one vote against. The draft resolution has not been adopted owing to the negative vote of a permanent member of the council. Washington and Israel say a Palestinian state can only be established through direct negotiations. Palestinian leaders said the U.S. veto was unfair, unethical and unjustified. Back here in Canada, drivers in Ontario and Quebec are dealing with some serious sticker shock after a double-digit jump in the price of gas. It hit highs not seen since the summer of 2022. According to Gas Wizard, which tracks gas prices in Canada, they spiked by about 14 cents a litre overnight, hitting nearly $1.80 through the GTA in Ottawa, $1.86 in Sudbury, and $1.89 in Montreal. Now, those aren't the highest prices in the country, but that sudden jump is having a big impact. As Philip Lee Shannock explains, this time the season is largely to blame. Watching the numbers, it's enough to make your head spin. $83 is uh, a, lot of, a lot for me. I'll probably put in a little bit less today and see if uh, the prices go down uh, next week. But yeah, definitely not filling it up uh, at $190. Through Ontario and Quebec, gas prices jumped 14 cents a litre overnight. 
it caught some off guard, but not everyone, like these drivers who raced to line up late Wednesday. Now the big question, what's to blame? 90 to 95 percent of the reason for the increase is seasonality. That is the switch from winter to summer. For summer, gasoline blends change. An expensive additive is used to combat air pollution. And when the transition happens in the spring, inventories drop. It all adds up to higher prices. By summer, they should be able to crank up output of the summer blend of gasoline, and we should start to see prices eventually ease. The change happens every year, but the Canadian Fuels Association blames other factors, like tensions in the Middle East. So geopolitical impacts is clearly the number one reason. And when you add to that, all these taxes that we face. The bulk of this increase has nothing to do with the carbon tax, which hit a few weeks ago and affected really the entirety of Canada. Only eastern parts of Canada and the U.S. are seeing this seasonal hike at the pumps now. Western regions supplied by Western refineries made the switch earlier and had greater inventory so drivers experienced less of a sticker shock. How to cope with that now on the minds of many in Ontario. Probably drive less. That's about the only solution I would have. Experts say prices should moderate soon, but summer driving season is just around the corner when higher demand generally means higher prices at the pumps. Phil Pichanok, CBC News, Toronto. A major change by Health Canada tonight will end a long-standing policy that blocked all men who have sex with men from donating to sperm banks. In a statement, Health Canada confirms it will instead ask gender-neutral, sexual, behavior-based donor screening questions. The move will lift a blanket ban that's been in place for more than 30 years. The changes come into effect on May the 8th. In Quebec, wheelchair users are speaking out tonight about being turned away for mammograms. As Alison Northcott shows us, it's a problem across the country, leaving many unable to get the potentially life-saving test. The last time Martha Twibanire had a mammogram, she had to call three clinics to find one that would accommodate her wheelchair. And she left that appointment never wanting to go back. You feel uncomfortable and you feel you're not welcome. The Quebec Advocacy Group for People with Disabilities says stories like Tribunire's are far too common. It surveyed nearly 100 Quebec clinics that offer mammograms and says nearly half said they couldn't do the scans for patients in wheelchairs. Uh, on 94 clinics, uh, we found that 43% of them are saying no, we don't accept uh, women in wheelchair. Linda Gauthier says she last had a mammogram a decade ago, an experience she says was so humiliating she hasn't had one since. They make me feel like guilty of not being able to, to stay, uh, you know, to stay on my feet. But how did you feel in that moment? I felt like second class citizen, even third class citizen. I felt uh, very bad. The Office of Quebec's health minister says all women eligible for breast cancer screening must have access to a mammogram and says a reminder will be sent to designated screening centres. You have to be your own advocate. Kirsten you... Sharp says she's never had a problem getting a mammogram in B.C., which offers a special mobile screening unit, but says problems can persist and education is key. The thing that I see that's frustrating is I have had friends who called the exact same location that I went to and they were denied access. And it just depends on who answers the phone. In New Brunswick, one group successfully lobbied the provincial government to improve access to the scans in hospitals. My experience was um, just, you know, I, I cannot go back there. Tuivaniere knows she'll need uh, another mammogram oh, soon and hopes it won't leave her feeling as bad as the last one did. Uh, Alison Northcott, CBC uh, News, Montreal. Uh, a big endorsement tonight for U.S. President Joe Biden's re-election campaign from an American political dynasty. Fifteen members of the Kennedy family joined Biden at a rally today. Kerry Kennedy called Biden her hero, saying her late father and uncles would have been pleased with his achievements. It's a strong rebuke of her brother Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's running as an independent. Now to Biden's Republican challenger, Donald Trump's criminal trial now has its 12 jurors and opening arguments could begin as early as Monday. As Katie Simpson shows us, it has the former president lashing out. 
Donald Trump's fate is now in the hands of 12 New Yorkers. A jury sworn in for a trial he says should not even be happening. It's supposed to be a lot of different places campaigning, but I've been here all day on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. The jury includes seven men and five women. There's a retired wealth manager. He's married with two kids, does yoga, and likes fly fishing. A corporate lawyer, originally from Oregon. He's unmarried and reads the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. An investment banker who follows Trump's posts on Truth Social and has read his book, The Art of the Deal. And an apparel company employee who says Trump seems, quote, very selfish and I don't like his persona, how he presents himself in public. The day was not without hiccups. Two of Trump's original jurors were unexpectedly excused and replaced, including a woman who feared being publicly identified after friends, family and colleagues suspected she'd been picked based on personal details described in court. The security concern is tremendous from the perspective of individuals that are out there that, you know, may be a little bit imbalanced that might try to come after the jurors after the fact. You see him here. Trump is trying to discredit the charges against him in the hush money payment case, presenting reporters with a stack of printed papers he says are news articles that agree with his point. But all of these are stories from legal experts saying how this is not a case. Trump's every word is being scrutinized. Thank you very much. As prosecutors say, he's repeatedly violated a gag order in this case for attacking witnesses on social media. The judge can sanction Trump by finding him, but the violations are intentional, and if they continue, then Trump can even be jailed. Jail is extremely unlikely for a gag order violation, legal experts say. The remaining jury alternates are expected to be picked Friday, clearing a path for opening arguments to begin Monday. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. 14 people in Montreal and Laval have been arrested in connection with a so-called emergency grandparent scam. Victims were led to believe they were speaking with a distressed loved one who urgently required funds for bail, legal fees, or other fictitious expenses. Victims were coerced through manipulative tactics to make payments and were further isolated by the threat of a gag order to silence any discussion of the situation. So police say the scheme targeted seniors with landline phones. The suspects are believed to be responsible for more than $2.2 million in reported losses across the country. The majority of the targeted victims live in Ontario and range in age between 46 and 95. Divisions in the Middle East are sparking debate at the Ontario legislature where a ban on wearing kafia scarves remains in place tonight. That's despite all four party leaders, including the premier, opposing it. Thomas Dagra takes us through the controversy. It's a contentious debate about Middle East identity and politics playing out at Ontario's legislature. The opposition NDP failing to reverse a move by the speaker Agreed? No. Agreed. I heard some no's. Newly banning from Queen's Park that traditional Palestinian scarf known as the kafia. The kafias are a political statement in my opinion. After receiving a complaint from an unnamed MPP, Speaker Ted Arnott points to decorum, saying members should not use props, signage or accessories that are intended to express a political message. Spotted in recent months at pro-Palestinian rallies, the kafia's history goes back much further. Long associated with late Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, it's been worn in the region for centuries. For me and many others uh, who are Arab or Palestinian, it is a representation of our identity. MPP Sarah Jama says she was expelled from the NDP caucus last year for online comments and her position on the war in Gaza and she's known to wear that scarf at the legislature. It's not just a political symbol, it's a cultural one. And to, to not allow that conversation and to just ban it full stop is upholding genocide. But Fine Brith Canada is urging Parliament and other legislatures to follow suit and ban the kafia that it says has been corrupted by radical elements as a symbol of their, uh, their desire to erase the state of Israel. Progressive Conservative Premier Doug Ford doesn't agree with the ban. 
we see the, the division right now that's going on. It's, it's not healthy, and this would just divide the community uh, even more. Federal Justice Minister Arif Varani calls the kafia an important cultural symbol that should be welcomed in all Canadian institutions. The Speaker of the Legislature says he would reconsider the kafia ban if all members here were to agree. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. A big move in the NHL. The Arizona Coyotes are officially headed to Utah. What's next for the franchise and those who have been loyal to the team for years? There are a lot of fans who are getting screwed over. Plus, scientists point out what caused a deadly heat wave in West Africa. Without human-induced global warming, these temperatures wouldn't have been possible. And... Fans say goodbye to guitar legend Dickie Betts. We're back in two. Dickie Betts, one of the founders of the Allman Brothers Band, has died at the age of 80. Betts is responsible for the band's biggest hit. He sang lead and played guitar on Ramblin' Man, their only single to chart in the top 10. Betts left the band in a very public split in 2000 and toured with his own band before retiring in 2014. His longtime manager said Betts passed away at his home in Florida. Well, the NHL has approved the sale and relocation of the Arizona Coyotes. The players will take to the ice in Utah next season. Cameron McIntosh now on the deal, the team's Manitoba roots, and the heartbroken fans. Resigned to relocation, the Arizona Coyotes knew this was it. It's going to hurt and it's going gonna, it's gonna to sting for, for a while. Josh Doan, a Coyotes player whose father Shane was an original Coyote, now officially bound for Salt Lake City in a deal reportedly exceeding a billion dollars that will see Coyotes players used to establish a new NHL team as the Arizona team goes dormant. To see them go from here, um, it's a bummer too. Mark Florentine is a former Winnipegger living in Phoenix who watched the same team leave Winnipeg. We're the, I think, fifth largest city in the United States and we should be able to support an NHL team. In 1996, the original Winnipeg Jets, amid public uproar, were relocated, rebranded in Phoenix as the NHL pushed south. This is going to be a very successful venture. Not really. The Yotes bled money for decades and didn't win much. Owners and court cases came and went as the NHL commissioner insisted the team stay in Arizona. Finally, unpaid bills forced a move to a 5,000-seat college arena as the current owner failed to develop a proper NHL rink. This was bad for the finances of the league, and this was particularly bad for the optics. Neil Longley is a professor of sports management and says after nearly three decades, a big question remains. When people say, was is Phoenix a hockey market? I'd say, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to know. Phoenix is a major U.S. media market. The NHL wants to be there. It will re-establish the team if the Coyotes owner can get a proposed rink built. Many Coyotes fans are skeptical. There are a lot of fans who are getting screwed over. Well, Winnipeg hockey fans can certainly relate to that, but fans of the current Jets, they're focused on a playoff run as NHL hockey in Arizona fades into a desert mirage. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. We are 98 days and counting from the 2024 Paris Olympic Games, and details of the opening ceremony are emerging. Organizers say it will last nearly four hours and include a parade of athletes in boats on the Seine, but the French president has said the open-air event could shift inside if the security threat is deemed to be too high. It takes a lot of determination and hard work to become an Olympian, and often something else, too bravery. That is being celebrated in a new collaborative campaign between CBC Radio Canada and the Canadian Olympic Committee ahead of the 2024 Paris Olympic Games. When we see Team Canada on the world stage, we're witnessing pure greatness. The campaign is called Brave is Unbeatable and it highlights the obstacles Canadian athletes have had to overcome. We don't see Maggie McNeil navigating her anxiety. 
Shea Gilgis Alexander getting cut from his high school team. And that voice is actor Michael J. Fox, who knows all about bravery and resilience after living with Parkinson's disease for decades. The French version is voiced by another famous Canadian, singer Celine Dion, more recently diagnosed with stiff person syndrome. The campaign launches Friday. The 2024 Paris Olympics begin July 26th. After the break, Rosie is here with Ad Issue. Hey, Ian, tonight the government tries to sell the budget to Canadians. Because we're asking the ultra-wealthy to pay a little more, the Conservatives have already come out and said they're voting against this budget. But how are voters, how are Canadians reacting? Chantal, Althea and Andrew join me to talk about that and more. And returning to that breaking news tonight, reports of explosions in Iran that U.S. news outlets are reporting was an Israeli strike. Iranian state media claiming three drones were seen near the city of Isfahan, but its air defense has shot them down. There is a large military base in that area and a nuclear research facility. Israel has been threatening to retaliate against Iran for days, Iran attacking last weekend, and we continue to watch for developments in this story. And in other international news, several countries in the Sahel region of Africa are experiencing deadly heat. And according to climate scientists, its intensity is a consequence of climate change. As Anand Ram explains, it could be just a taste of what's to come. From above and below, a hospital in Niger tries to rehydrate this elderly woman. Her daughter says extreme heat drained the water from her mother's body. A crisis throughout April in the Sahel region of Africa that was made worse when people were fasting for Ramadan. More people were therefore more exposed to the extreme heat and we did not did, did have enough capacity to, capacity to pull themselves down. Those nearly 50 degree days in early April especially now being blamed on climate change. Without human induced global warming, these temperatures wouldn't have been possible. That week-long heat wave stretched from Senegal to Mali, Niger and Chad, a region that knows heat. But even at our current level of global warming, scientists say such an extreme would only be seen once every 200 years. And if the planet continues to barrel towards two degrees of warming above pre-industrial temperatures, it's expected to be more like once every 20 years. Also contributing sea surface temperatures surging to new highs across all oceans. All that heat is moving really northward from the Gulf of Guinea into West Africa and creating, you know, this heat that we are, that we are seeing. In Mali, that heat has killed, with a hospital reporting more than 100 people dying over a few days earlier this month. Say experts a disproportionate climate burden for a region that pumps far less carbon into the atmosphere. The parts of Africa which are impacted at the moment are contributing close to nothing to uh, the actual emissions, meaning that they are basically experiencing the consequences of the deeds of other people elsewhere. Forecasts suggest the region could see this deadly heat well into June. And experts warn as farmers ready their crops for the typically rainy season, they need to take precautions to avoid heat stroke and dehydration. Anand Ram, CBC News, Toronto. Prince William returned to public royal duties today with a delivery to a London youth centre. This is his first working appearance since his wife Catherine revealed she was undergoing chemotherapy for cancer. William has been absent from official engagements as the couple and their three young children deal with the diagnosis in private. He was said to be in good spirits. Now let's break down the week in politics. It is Thursday, which means Rosie is here with that issue. At issue this week, selling the budget with promises of fairness and affordability. But some measures, like a hike on the capital gains tax, are drawing concern. We raised some additional revenue, asking those at the very top to pay a little bit more. That is what is financing the big investments in housing, in affordability, in economic growth that the federal government is making. 
How have Canadians responded to the budget plan and how much does the government have to sell it? Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton, here to break it down tonight on At Issue, Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. Althea, let's start with you uh, tonight. Do you, do you, how, let's start with this issue of capital gains because it has become sort of the... Uh, the, the one thing that people are questioning, I think, a little bit, particularly people who have money or people who own businesses. Is this something that the government uh, could be problematic for the government or is this something that they would welcome? Uh, I, I think it can be both things, frankly. Yeah. It yeah. can be problematic in the sense that you already are starting to see uh, opposition mount against it. And rich people tend to have access to loud megaphones to make their voice heard in a way that poor people don't have. Um, so it's natural that you hear more from one side or the institutional voice is more on this side. But there is a concern that it turns into a fight a little bit like the fight on private corporations during the Bill Morneau era of 2017, where you have people who are sympathetic to the greater public, to the middle class, and even to people who are trying, working hard, struggling to join it, um, where it feels a little unfair, like mm. the single mother who is a doctor who uses her private corporation to invest for her pension, for example, or that sure. is. So there are sympathetic people that might emerge that might make the sell of this more complicated uh, than the government intends. But I will say that, you know, listening to question period this week, the only party that seemed to be really keen to talk about the budget was the Bloc Québécois because of all of the federal meddling in provincial jurisdiction. The Conservatives did not seem at all interested in talking mm -hmm. about this budget, mm -hmm. so you have to see it as a win for the Liberals. The Liberals do want to engage, you could call it class warfare, this discussion about we're taxing the ultra-rich to pay for those who need it, basically the 2015 playbook that did work well for them. There are concerns in caucus, uh, among MPs who have their supporters are blue liberals or who fundraise using blue liberals, that they're alienating some core supporters. But the government clearly has made the play that they're going after center left voters and that is their ticket to possibly stay in office a bit longer. There is, I think, Andrew, some questions about um, not the ultra rich, but people, for instance, who own a second residence, uh, cottages would spring to mind, uh, how they might be affected by that capital gains thing. So you can see how, yes, it could could do what the government, I think, wants it to do, but it could also affect people that might get sort of caught up in it, we, we, you know, unintentionally or, or even if they have a little bit more money. Yeah, I mean, there, I think there are more than a few echoes of the small business fiasco. Well, we'll see whether it turns into that, but including the overconfidence of the government on this. At, on budget day, I think I looked at it and I thought, well, this is probably bad policy, but good politics. Who doesn't like soaking the rich? I've kind of come around to the view that it's actually good policy, but bad politics. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you're moving the tax system more towards neutrality. At, at, yes. at two-thirds inclusion rated, you're, you're basically equalizing the tax treatment of capital gains, dividends, and interest, and that's good policy in and of itself. The problem in policy terms, first of all, is if you only do that and you don't do anything else, if you don't do it as part of a broader tax reform, then you are kind of basically raising taxes at a time when that's the last signal the government should be sending. Uh, but in policy terms, it's even worse, I think, from that, or actually political terms, it's even worse from that standpoint. As we saw, and as the government should have learned from the small business uh, debacle, uh, if you only do one reform of a tax and not of a, of a broader thing where you've got winners and losers and people can sort of see pluses and minuses in it, if you just basically single out one group, mm. uh, then it's very easy for them to say that they've, they've been victims of selective justice. And particularly when it's a group that sees itself as being small businesses and plucky entrepreneurs and that kind of thing. And so, as you say, it's not just the people who can declare $250,000 in capital gains in a year who are going to be hit by this. It is people who have second homes, cottages, et cetera, and it's people who have corporations. Uh, and they are people like doctors and lawyers. I had a woman stop me at lunch today to complain bitterly about this. I can't remember that happening after any previous budget. So they may find this is going to, I mean, they poked the hornet's nest again. We'll see. Yeah, it, it could also, if it was framed properly, <laughs> Chantel, be, uh, you know, said that it is about fairness, actually bringing fairness to the taxation system. I, I don't know that it's that it's unfolding that way right now, but give, give me your thoughts on how they're managing this particular issue. It's always dangerous uh, when we do political analysis to confuse noise for uh, a large audience and for sure the people who are affected by this uh, command attention and the media in a way that the people who are not do not. Yeah. 
I'm not convinced that people who are struggling to pay a mortgage on the first home or who are trying to buy a first home or find an apartment are going to have a lot of sympathy for uh, cottage owners who worry <laughs> that their $700,000 profit might be taxed more or closer to what their actual income is taxed which is what happens to people who do not have that uh, cottage. So I think the saving grace for the liberals on this is that the conservatives understand the perils of making this their, their choice battleground on this budget, yeah. Yeah. that they will be exposed as fighting for people. It's easy to write a story about the single mother who is using uh, et cetera, for a pension. It's easy also to show that they are defending someone with a $2 million uh, gain on a cottage on a nice lake in Ontario. Yeah. And then you look like you're fighting for people who actually have more than a home. Yeah. It may be bad politics, but I noticed that today the Quebec government announced that it would match the federal move uh, and and tax at the same level. So I'm yeah. guessing that uh, the revenues are worth more than the, the bad optics in the eye of other governments. We'll see. Yeah, but Andrew, you want this, to get in there? Yeah. All I would say is that the same arguments could have been made about the small business tax changes, that they were basically, you know, they were perfectly reasonable changes. They were basically just slightly limiting the ability of people to turn themselves into corporations for tax reasons. So you wouldn't have thought it would cause the government a great deal of problem, and I doubt that uh, the average person was terribly sympathetic. But the ability of a very determined group that sees itself as victims and, and, and is sincerely convinced that it's been terribly treated, the ability of that government to make a lot of trouble for a government, of that group to make a lot of trouble for a government and occupy space that the government would, would like to be devoted to other questions, uh, I think should not be discounted. Chantal, then I'll and, yeah. and that kind of tells you probably why the Liberals spent three weeks detailing their budget before presenting the budget, because mm -hmm. right. ever since they did present the budget, that is basically all you've heard about. Uh, you didn't hear about the deficit that's higher because it's not, yeah. so, so that captured a lot of the attention. But I'm not sure that the small business controversy cost the Liberals a lot of vote back then. It, yeah. did, it did take a lot of attention away from other things they might have wanted, but I'm yeah. not sure that it sank them in the polls. Right, but when you're 20 points behind the polls, you need every good week of media coverage and, and you know, contra controversy-free coverage you can. So sure. anything that occupies that is going to hurt them. Althea. Well, it's still better than raising the GST two <laughs> points to get the same income. <laughs> Althea, that's true. Okay. That's true. Choices. That's true. Althea. I, I think the difference between the example of 2017 and now is that now we have something to compare it against in the sense that in 2017, the changes to um, <laughs> private corporations were kind of done in a vacuum, like the yes. government is thinking about doing this. And now the government is saying, <laughs> we're doing this to pay for housing for millennials and yeah. Generation Z. Yeah. And I yeah. think that these individuals who really feel like the system is unfair, like that they're not gonna have as great a life as their parents had, will feel that, it's too early obviously, it's only been two days to see what the yeah. polling is, but their deficit with millennials and Generation Z is so large that you have to think that they have thought this through yeah. and this is what they're saying. So all these people might complain and they might complain really loudly, but they're the ones who are preventing you from having a home, for being able to afford your rent. Like yeah. I think that changes the calculation and the yeah. gamble for the government. Uh, uh, Andrew doesn't believe they've thought it through. I, I'm just, the record. That was, uh, that was I'm just not sure we have to accept that. <laughs> That's fine. Yes, but That's uh, fine. It, will help, it will help the government if the people complaining are all baby boomers. Uh, or or all people who have a lot of money. Okay, that, that was a good conversation. We're going to pause it there. Uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, Pierre Poiliev sat down with Radio Canada this week where he was asked about his plans for the future, a future Poiliev government. That's next. Pierre Poiliev is criticizing the budget, but when the opposition leader sat down with Radio-Canada's Patrice Roy, he would not commit to what government programs he would keep and what he would get rid of. Est-ce que vous gardez ou pas, là? Assurance dentaire, gardez-vous ça? Ça n'existe pas. C'est fini. Ça n'existe pas. On verra ce qu'il va faire avec ça, M. Trudeau. On a une promesse. On a des promesses sur toutes sortes de programmes. 
Does the Conservative leader need to be saying more? Does his critique of the budget resonate for Canadians? Let's bring everybody back. Chantal, Andrew and Althea. Um, Chantal, I, I, I thought this interview was interesting and revealing because I thought the questions were uh, fair, they were substantive, there was an attempt to get real answers from Mr. Poiliev on a series of different policy issues. Um, it, I'll let you evaluate his answers though. What, what did you make of, of how he fared there? I thought that uh, his answers on uh, the, the dental plan or pharmacare were actually astute answers in the sense that, uh, and, and they do not answer the question fully, but in the sense sure. that these are plans that the government has that have yet to see the light of day. I believe oh. dental care is going to happen. Yes. Uh, and I didn't hear Mr. Poiliev saying that if it did happen, he would trash it. But he is right in saying that these are works in progress. And before you decide you're going to trash or eliminate something, you should at least know that it exists. Sure. And on pharmacare, I have strong doubt. Al Althea had a very strong reaction, so we'll go to her next. <laughs> well, it's not true. I mean, he said clearly during that interview that yeah. not a single child's teeth had been cleaned through the government's program, which is actually just not true. So the program, no, as it was originally... No, he didn't say a child's teeth. He said the teeth. No teeth. teeth. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. no teeth. Yes. Well, so according to the government's own website, 436,860 children have used this program. Now, it isn't the, the fully fleshed out version of the program that's supposed to roll out in January, but the interim measures that mm. were agreed upon with the NDP that kicked in in December 2022 um, have materialized. Lots of parents have received money, more than 400 million. Yeah. So <laughs> you can't say, I would hope that a politician can't go on, the, on, on national TV and just lie like that. Like that that's not fair to the audience. You, we should be arguing about facts. We should not be making up facts so we can argue about things that are not accurate. I, I, I find that very troubling. Uh, uh, he, uh, was, he, was giving, he was giving that interview in Quebec where kids were covered before the federal that's, initiative. That, that's fair. Okay, that's so that's for fair. For the record. Uh, Andrew, you, you, you watched it too. Let me get your impression of just about how, like, what he's trying to do in terms of how he's criticizing the budget and position himself. Yeah. Well, we should say, first of all, there was a worse lie in there, which was uh, claiming that, uh, that the, the bill that brings in not pharmacare but some timid beginnings of it uh, would mean that you'd lose your private uh, drug insurance. Now, that is potentially true if they were ever to go to... Um, um, universal, you know, universal um, single payer. Single payer is a polite way of saying government monopoly. So he'd be on firmer ground. But it, as it stands, that's precisely why the Liberals haven't gone there, because they know it's, that's not a political winner, and uh, certainly is bad policy in my view as well. Uh, that was look, on another interview today. Yeah, uh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, but yeah, look, he, he 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 absolutely at some point has to talk about what he'd cut. I think he would, he would like to see, see him talk about what he would cut to try to bring spending back in line with revenues and, and reduce the deficit. Uh, whether he will or not, I don't know. On the day after the budget, I'm not sure he's necessarily obliged to go into detail about his spending plans. I think an opposition leader on the day of a budget or the day after a budget is entitled to focus his fire on the government of the day and the proposals sure. that it has put forward, sure. uh, which do indeed involve rampant uh, increases in spending. Uh, there's no necessity to be raising taxes to finance even the programs the government is putting forward because somewhere surely to God in a $500 billion dollar uh, budget, you can find the savings to finance those housing programs. So, he, you know, he's entitled to rain his fire on the government at that point, but I think at some point he does have to, to start to talk about what he would do and what he would cut. Chantal? Uh, I, I understand the, the part about lying. His Quebec lieutenant was on radio saying the federal government spends 20 billion, $21 billion on consulting fees, actually. The figure is in the millions and not the billions. But, uh, but the critique of the budget is one thing. I don't think that uh, Pierre Poiliev needs to say that he's going to be killing programs that have yet to take off. Yeah. Uh, and at this point, he is right when he says the pharmacare program is just a word uh, on a press release. Yeah, Althea. that's fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually thought it, there was, it was quite revealing for what he chose to say and what he decided not to say. Yes, so we yes, don't yes. have him on where he, what he would do on pharmacare or what he would do on dental care or even what he would do on capital gains because 
the anchor kind of tried to direct him in a way, but he didn't really agree with the anchor. It wasn't really clear, and then that clip was over. So we don't really know what he would do on capital gains. I think there is a lot on the Tory side of let's wait and see what's entrenched, what we could get rid of without paying a political price, and then we'll decide. But he has been very clear. Um, he does want to reduce the size of the deficit uh, and eventually the debt. He has been very honest about what that horizon could mean, which is, I don't know, uh, which I appreciate. I like it when politicians tell you what they know and what they don't know. Um, he has talked about, you know, reducing spending in order to enact new spending. His housing plan actually in some ways, it's quite similar to the Liberals' new yeah. housing plan. It does feel like the Liberals stole a few pages off the Pierre Poilievre playbook when it came to zoning around public transit, for example, the way they would deal with municipalities. So there is some overlap. It was, I like it when politicians talk to the media, and I do think that the audience was well served. They did learn something. I yep. just wish we were a bit more factual yeah. when we talked yeah. about this. Uh, I, yeah. think, I don't think he has to oppose the capital gains increase. In fact, I think he'd be smart not to. I think he'd yeah. be smarter to talk about what's the broader tax reform agenda? How can we get tax rates down rather than why should we have a special preference for capital gains? That's both smart from conservative tax policy perspective, but I think it's also smart politically. Well, the capital he has gains said he will reduce yeah. income tax. He has said that. Yeah. yeah, the capital gains thing did seem like a bit of a trap for him uh, that the Liberals had set there too, Chantal. And he didn't go there and it yeah. was noticeable. And I think that's the wise thing to do because uh, what the, the Liberals really, really want is for the Conservatives to engage on that field. I think they're not going to get that battle. Okay, good conversation. You, you did double duty this week, so I don't know, extra, extra thanks, extra, extra thanks to all of you to be here Tuesday and Thursday. Thank you both very much. Have a good weekend. And with that, I'll send things back to Ian in Vancouver. Thanks, Rosie. Next, a flight attendant gives a sweet surprise to a bride-to-be. She had asked all of the ladies on board who are married if they could offer some words of encouragement or advice. The paper napkin advice in our moment. That is Brie Kunkel and her friends on the way to her bachelorette party, and they are in for a big surprise. One of the flight attendants asked passengers who are or have been married to write their best piece of marriage advice, and tonight their words of wisdom make our moment. It was a super, super sweet and heartwarming moment. So we were going to Austin, we were flying out from California, and our super sweet flight attendant came by and she asked what we were celebrating. And we told her that it was my bachelorette weekend. I guess she wanted to make me feel extra special. Just in case you were wondering, we have a young lady who is a bride-to-be. She is quite the princess. She had asked all of the ladies on board who are currently married or have ever been married if they could get out a pen, she'd give them a napkin and they can offer some words of encouragement or advice. I picked out some of my favorites for you. Always marry your best friend. Beyond that, never start doing a job you're not prepared to do forever, like ironing. And never shovel snow. <laughs> This one gave me an acronym. It says HALT, basically saying HALT whenever you're feeling these things. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Just kind of sit and wait before you act. <laughs> and then this one's my favorite. It's a choice, not an emotion, to love every day. Choose to love him, forgive when needed, and choose to grow old together. God bless Dina, the flight attendant. So a cool idea, what to do now with all of those uh, napkins. And, and one person suggests maybe send them to a printer and have other napkins made up with all of those inscriptions on them for her wedding, which is a cool idea, except for one thing. She said there were certain ones that she couldn't read for us because they were kind of naughty or funny or for some reason inappropriate for television. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanamansing in Vancouver. Good night.